I remember a time of chaos, ruined dreams, this wasted land. But most of all, I remember the road warrior, the man we called Max, the warrior Max. In the roar of an engine, he lost everything. became a shell of a man, a burnt out, desolate man, a man haunted by the demons of his past, a man who wandered out into the wasteland, and it was here, in this blighted place, that he learned to live again. How did you get through out there? Where did you find him? Two or three miles down the road left for dead. We had a deal. He said if I bought him back here, he'd give me some gas. Just walk away. Give me a pump. The oil. The gasoline. And the whole compound. And I spare you lives. Remember one thing that is more than just a tanker of gas. That is our lifeline. You want to get out of here? Talk to me. Mad Max 2 arrived on our screens in late December 1981, produced on a small budget at the time of about 2 million US dollars. It grossed over 50 million worldwide. It was the first Australian movie to be recorded in Dolby Stereo. The first episode was the first to be shot in Cinemascope. Mad Max 1 was an incredible success, being the most profitable film for years. Produced on an even smaller budget, first time director George Miller made a name for himself overnight. It was the most successful film in Australia, taking more money there at the box office than Star Wars. It did incredibly well in other territories, but once it came to the USA, there were a number of problems with its distribution. American International Pictures picked it up for distribution, but were going through financial problems, and they also felt many wouldn't understand the Australian accents, and dubbed it over with American actors, changing some of the dialogue to remove the Aussie slang. This was the dumbest idea ever. It took a while for me to view it with the original audio. Because of the poor marketing of Mad Max, it failed to get the audience it deserved in the United States, despite its huge success everywhere else. When it came to the sequel, Warners had picked up the rights for US distribution, and feeling many wouldn't be aware of the character Mad Max, they retitled the film The Road Warrior, instead of Mad Max 2. However, Warners were unaware that Mad Max had in fact built up a large audience on cable TV, and the public was well aware of him and so on more recent Blu-ray and DVD releases of the film. It's now titled Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior, to help avoid any confusion. The movie was shot in continuity, which rarely happens with productions. Shot on location near Broken Hill in Australia in the middle of winter. It was a very short shoot at 12 weeks long. Because of their location, they had to wait up to a week to view the developed 35mm rushes. George Miller states on the Blu-ray commentary that they were making the movie up as they went along. They wanted it to be minimal on dialogue and for the story to be told in movie language. This film could have no dialogue and you would still be invested and understand what's going on. Very much like Conan the Barbarian, which turned up a year later. Mel Gibson was only 21 when he played Max in the first movie, so when it came to the sequel, he had changed a lot. He looked more like a man, far more grown up, whereas in the first movie he does look his age. Mel is obviously more confident in the movie, but probably has far less dialogue, apparently only having 16 lines in the entire film. 
he just tends to act with his eyes and facial expressions. He barely smiles but finally does at the end despite the battering he has received. Bruce Spence plays the gyro captain. He had just come out of hospital when he shot the film and was still unwell on the shoot. The director said he had struggled to get out of the ground as he jumped out to surprise Mad Max. Bruce Spence is insanely thin. I'm a thin guy and he makes me look fat. He has had a very successful career and turned up in small parts in Lord of the Rings, Star Wars Episode 3 and I fondly remember him from The Matrix Revolutions as the train man. Virginia Hay plays the warrior woman and the oil refinery. This was her first movie and possibly her first acting gig. She went on to have a successful career in TV. Most people will probably know her from the TV series Farscape. The leader of the Marauders is Humongous, played by some random Swedish bodybuilder. Originally they thought the character would be Goose, Max's mate from the first film who got burned in an attack, but they decided against it in the end. But there are a few hints that indicate this idea, such as the horrible burns to his face, the use of the police cars and the similar firearm he uses. But if you think about it, making Goose a villain wouldn't entirely make sense, having him become what he fought against. He would have become more like Max. Vernon Wells plays Wes, the very creepy homicidal punk. He is a fan favourite for playing over the top villains, most fondly remembered for playing Bennett in Commando, who the actor Vernon Wells refers to as Freddie Mercury on steroids. Also playing as Mr Igo in Inner Space and making a cameo appearance in Weird Science. He has also had a successful career since starring in Bad Max 2 and has been heavily involved in the Power Rangers Time Force series. The film opens with a prologue shot in the Academy Ratio, explaining what happened in the future and also shows scenes from Mad Max 1. You never really know what year it is. The narration gives many a head start on what's happening. I really love this intro and the clever use of stock footage to demonstrate the destruction of civilization. It's something I wish they had expanded more in the film, but thankfully in the third movie they do address more of the backstory. Then it cuts to glorious cinemascope with Max racing ahead, trying to escape from a gang led by a crazed motorcycle rider, Wes. He manages to take out two of the gang's vehicles. Wes gets hurt in the process but manages to escape. After collecting some fuel from the destroyed cars, he spots a nearby auto gyro and inspects it for fuel. However, the auto gyro has been booby trapped by the pilot, but Max overpowers him and sets his trusty dog on him. In exchange for his own life, the pilot tells Max about a small oil refinery in the nearby wasteland. Max arrives just as the Marauders besiege the compound. The leader, a large muscular man with a hockey mask covering his disfigured face, called the Humongous, tries to convince the settlers to surrender their stronghold in exchange for safe passage out of his territory. The gang is desperate for more fuel and it's the only valuable substance in the wasteland. Max and the gyro captain stake out the refinery and watch a group of settlers attempt to escape, but the gang capture, torture, rape and kill the woman, whilst our partner is left for dead. Max makes a deal with a mortally wounded man to bring him back to the compound in exchange for a tank of petrol. The man dies shortly after Max returns him and the settler's leader can't honour the deal because it wasn't confirmed before the man's death. The settlers are on the verge of killing Max when the marauders return and Humongous repeats his offer. Max offers the leader of the group another deal. He will retrieve the abandoned Max semi-truck he saw a few days ago, capable of hauling the settler's tank of trailer or fuel. In exchange for his freedom, his vehicle and as much petrol as he can take with him. The settlers accept, but keep Max's car to ensure his cooperation. Max sneaks out, joining forces with the gyro captain. Max drives the semi-truck back to the compound, narrowly evading Humongous' men and thus gains the settlers' trust and they want him to escape with him, but Max opts to collect his petrol and leave. However, his attempt to break through the siege fails rather miserably, as Wes gives chase using a nitrous oxide equipped car and runs Max off the road, wrecking his car and seriously wounding him. Max hides behind a rock before the gang approach the wreckage, but they spot Max's dog and kill it with a crossbow, before attempting to siphon the fuel from his car. However, this triggers an explosive booby trap that destroys the car and gang members nearby. Believing Max is dead, Wes heads back to the base. Meanwhile, Max is slowly losing consciousness. The Black Interceptor driven by Max is a 1973 Ford Falcon. XBGT Coupe, a car apparently exclusive to Australia. A limited number of these cars were exported by Ford to New Zealand and the UK but never made it to the USA. Since only about 900 were produced, they have become highly sought after by collectors. It seems to be the original car from the original film, from what I read online. 
It was apparently commissioned to be scrapped after the shoot, but someone saved it and brought it back for the sequel. It makes me laugh doing many of the car chases as to simulate the intense speed, they just speed up the film in post-production. Many of the cars couldn't go so fast over the bumpy terrain, so they had to speed up in post which is understandable, but does provide some hilarious results. All you need to do is just add some Benny Hill music and it will be a nice spoof. It had been reported that the amazing stunt pulled off near the end was actually an accident. They decided to leave it in. When the biker gets knocked off his bike and spins through the air, propelling the stuntman 65 feet. The stuntman broke his leg badly, but luckily survived. Brian May returns to score Mad Max 2, not to be confused with Brian May from the band Queen, as myself and many others I'm sure did. He's an Australian composer who just happens to have the same name. The score to the original had a more romantic classical tone to it, and felt it belonged to a medieval war epic. It's not to say it didn't suit the film, but in some scenes it did feel like it belonged to a different genre. It also had a beautiful love theme for Max and Jesse. In the sequel, Brian May provides another bombastic traditional score, but it doesn't have the heart of the original because obviously the movie deals with different themes. As soon as the movie kicks in after the prologue, the music just takes over. Through the entirety of the driving scenes, the score always delivers, adding more tension to the perfectly executed sequences. There are great dramatic moments, especially when the gyro captain witnesses the death of the woman. It's a really stirring score. The soundtrack isn't too difficult to track down and is available on iTunes. I don't think the complete score is available on CD, as it's hard to tell how much music Brian May composed. The CD has a track of sound effects from the film, which you rarely find on soundtrack releases. The Mad Max trilogy has been spoofed, homaged and has heavily influenced many films and even cartoons in their visual design and action set pieces. Fist of the North Star is probably the most heavily influenced by the series, with the lead character Kenshiro walking around an apocalyptic future battling against thugs who seem to have been taken straight out of a Mad Max movie. Mad Max himself is a very likeable character despite him being very self-centred and only really out to do things to benefit himself. The opening narration to the sequel indicates that the death of his wife and child has changed him. He clearly prefers to be alone and it's never suggested what his role is other than just travelling the wasteland. Even though he does come across as heartless, in the sequels he does show signs of his past self. Showing a connection to the feral kid and in Thunderdome where he meets the kids who remind me of the lost boys from Peter Pan. Mad Max 2 is considered the best out of the trilogy down to its constant action and great pace. The film feels like one long car chase that never stops for a breather. It obviously does stop for dialogue to be exchanged but you barely notice it. I think its story is the weakest out of the three, it's wafer thin in content but it does have an incredible atmosphere and as I said tremendous action to make up for those shortcomings. Each film in the series feels fundamentally different to the next. They could exist without having any connection, they could all be separate movies. One of the scenes that always drives me nuts because I don't understand why Max can be so stupid is when he leaves the base after getting the petrol he needs and heads straight towards the enemy and obviously gets taken out within minutes, ruining his chance to escape. And he gets his dog killed. He could have gone out the back and the gang wouldn't have known. It's all done to drive up tension and to frustrate the audience. I love the photography in the movie, especially the great shots of the landscape and the moments before darkness when Max discusses his plans to retrieve the tanker. But during the night shots it's actually very hard to see what's going on. Even when I saw it on VHS you could barely see what was happening. Most filmmakers would cheat and use a filter to simulate the look of night, but here they don't do that. That year Escape from New York used a new special lens to extract the maximum amount of light during night shoots, and I think the lens would have helped a lot on Mad Max 2. The movie does have some great subtle moments of humour, mostly exhibited by the mechanics and the interactions between Max and the gyro captain with great moments such as when Max pinches his telescope and during Humongous' speech it just cuts to Mel looking disinterested, eating dog food. George Miller is an extremely versatile director who can handle any genre without any problems. If you look at his body of work he goes from Mad Max and The Witches of Eastwick to the Babe series and Happy Feet. He has proved successful in many different genres throughout his career. It's great to know he's finally returning to the series he created. It's taken years for a fourth movie to happen. The new movie is called Fury Road, starring the talented Tom Hardy. Some reports say it's a reboot, whereas on IMDb it says it's set before Mad Max 2. I'm sure more information will be revealed once the trailer comes out. Mad Max 2 is certainly up there in the list of best sequels. It demonstrates Miller has improved as a director in a short space of time. With the help of the great DP Dean Semler, the camera setups really help create a large movie 
even on a small budget, and the production team provided a technically competent movie that is fondly remembered for its daring stunts and action set pieces. A lot of praise has to be given to the stuntmen, who went above and beyond to demonstrate they had no fear. The film is highly respected by audiences and critics alike. Roger Ebert awarded the film 3.5 stars out of 4, saying it was skillful filmmaking and a film like no other. Critic Leonard Moulton even went out of his way to provide an introduction to the movie on the DVD and Blu-ray release. Despite the discussion being only 5 minutes long, he summed up the quality of the movie extremely well. I know some people don't get on with Mad Max 2 because of its lack of story and its dark and violent approach, but the film does clearly what it says on the tin. It's an aggressive action movie that's not for the faint-hearted, a non-stop chase. What you see on screen is real, no CG or optical effects, but behind the mental action scenes is a lead character that has universal appeal. He is a survivor, a champion of the oppressed, and that's what makes him timeless. What is it with you? Huh? What are you looking for? Come on, Max, everyone's looking for something. You're happy out there, are you? Hey, wandering? One day blurring into another? That's all they want, the tanker. So they come straight after us. So we'll use that to punch our way out. If it's all the same to you, I'll drive that tanker. And how do you think you'd do it? I mean, look at you. You couldn't even drive a wheelchair. You should look at yourself, Max. You're a mess. Come on, cut the crap. On the best chance you've got. 